All right. Um, I'm very excited to be here with you today to talk about um, shifting gears a little bit, the unearthing biology in plant and animal genomes, specifically with hi fi sequencing. So, a little bit different. So, I've been waiting a really long time to be able to say this. And now I'm pretty confident that is pretty much true. Genome assembly has become routine or mostly routine. If we look back over the past several years at genome assemblies of rice that have been produced, um, it shows you just how far we've come. So back in 2015, a large group of researchers embarked on a rice genome, which is just under 400 megabases in size. Uh, they used a painstaking back-by-back -back approach sequenced on the PacBio RS2 instrument um, and took months of time to create a, a really quite a high quality genome assembly, uh, but with a lot of time and money um, sunk into it. Fast forward a couple years and shifting to a whole genome sequencing approach on a higher throughput SQL instrument, um, we saw that this reduced the project time down to a couple of weeks and still kept the genome in the one megabase contig and 50 club. Um, um, but, but if you actually compare that with where we are today, you see it gets even better. This paper from a few months ago shows hi-fi sequencing on our SQL2 system, our highest throughput instrument yet, um, requiring only days of time to get all the way from sample to the high quality contig assembly for a fraction of uh, the time and cost. And, and you can also see that the contiguity is back on par with the, pan, with the painstaking um, uh, manual process from 2015. So that's really incredible to see. And it's not just rice genomes that have gone into this kind of production mode or production scale. Um, I see at least a handful of publications on high quality genome assemblies across the entire eukaryotic tree of life coming out daily. Um, and of course, there are these large initiatives like the VGP, the EBP, the Darwin Tree of Life that are aiming to catalog thousands to hundreds of thousands of species with high quality reference genomes um, that have adopted PAC bio sequencing as the core technology for building out these genomic resources. So um, knowing that genome assembly has been simplified significantly with hi-fi sequencing, um, I'd love to go back and share a little bit about the biology of, of what these genomes are unearthing. In fact, it was this time last year at this exact conference that I shared with you what I consider to be the ultimate test for hi-fi sequencing, uh, which was sequencing and assembling the hexaploid California redwood genome. As a reminder, this genome it has six copies of a nine gigabase genome, putting it at nine times the size of the human genome. Last year, I showed you how we took the standard workflow for DNA extraction, sequencing, and assembly, and it took only seven days to conquer this beast. And that resulting assembly checked all the boxes of what a high quality assembly is with high contiguity, um, it resolved most of the hexaploidy into the individual haplotypes. It captured most of the genes and had high uh, base pair accuracy. And since then, we've taken a little closer look uh, at the biology goings on within this genome. So I actually went back to the exact same tree, gathered some more needles from branches I could reach, um, and then we sequenced full length RNA via the PacBio isoseq method um, at the University of Delaware Sequencing Center. And if you want the full story about what we found, I encourage you to check out the Medium story uh, written by my colleague, Liz Sang. And so when the resulting full-length transcripts are mapped back to the genome, we see a large amount of alternative splicing um, as that you see here in orange, as well as the extremely long introns that ancient conifers like this are known for. So I, I find that to be pretty cool. And then in addition, Liz used a tool that she developed called isophase to separate out the transcript data into haplotypes. And as you can see, the individual isoseq reads group really nicely by the allele. So interestingly, there are six genome haplotypes at this particular locus, but two of them diverged only at non-coding regions. So isophase only reported five alleles. Um, and this actually aligns uh, pretty well with the genome assembly that we reported. Um, that seems to be split mostly into five haplotypes, giving two pieces of, of good evidence on the divergence time of, the, of two of these subgenomes. 
And if we take a look at other plants being sequenced, um, I'm seeing kind of a big trend toward the idea of pan genomes. Um, there's certainly no shortage of reviews and perspective papers coming out touting the utility of pan genomes for crop breeding. Um, there's also no shortage of papers being published utilizing pan genomes to identify genetic causes of specific agronomic traits of interest. Um, and because of this boom in pan genome research, we're also seeing many new tools being developed to help build out pan genome graphs, identify variants in the data, and identify which members of a population to use for the best genetic representation within your pan genome sequencing project. Uh, but what exactly is a pan genome? In the most basic definition, a pan genome identifies which portions of the genome are unique and which, over, are, uh, which overlap and are therefore core to the species. From an evolutionary perspective, the core genes identified in a pan genome are likely to be the genes that perform critical functions. Therefore, they tend to be pretty conserved within a species. In contrast, uh, the dispensable genes contribute to the diversity of the species enabling it to adapt to the various environmental conditions, whether that be diseases, uh, pests, or uh, climate. And therefore, the dispensable genes are likely to be evolving faster. As a result, it's these dispensable parts of the genome that's a major contributor to phenotypic variation of agronomically important traits and will be of particular interest for improving crop productivity, um, and also likely to play a critical role in adaptive evolution and domestication. And when you think about a species like maize, where any two lines share only about half of their genetic sequence, it becomes clear that although a single reference genome sequence is the backbone of genomic infrastructure, it can't really represent the full complement of sequence diversity of a species. Um, furthermore, many agronomically important traits are tied to structural variants, uh, similar to the, the rare diseases in humans, um, that are really difficult to capture by short read sequencing or reference-based analysis. So, as you can imagine, having a full pan genome that captures all sequence variation of a species would be able to help in identifying useful variants in wild relatives to bring into cultivated varieties or to home in on the genetic basis for traits that are important to commercialization of a crop that haven't been tied to SNPs um, or to assist in making breeding decisions uh, for, for more efficiency in those programs. And in fact, here's a recent example from an excellent paper that came out in Cell on the pan genome of 26 accessions of soybeans. Um, apparently, soybean plants can have iron deficiency that leads to yellowing leaves. And the pan genome enabled the researchers to identify specifically a 1.4 KB indel in an iron transporter gene that is implicated as a QTL for iron uptake ability. And the presence or absence of this particular variant made it possible to classify the 26 accessions into two distinct haplogroups. Um, and because iron availability is tied to soil pH, with low soil pH, meaning iron is more available, and high pH, meaning iron is bound to oxide and have higher, uh, harder for the plant to absorb, um, these two haplotypes split by what type of soil they are predominantly grown in. Um, which is pretty cool as a finding as it points to the gen genetic divergence of this gene contributing to the soybean adaptation. Um, and if we take a look at the animal kingdom, we're seeing the fruits of these large genome initiatives that have been producing reference genomes at production scale. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the Vertebrate Genomes Project published a special issue of Nature, uh, releasing many genome papers of the species that they've sequenced. And one of these papers in particular was on the genomes of the platypus and the echidna. And these are the only living monotremes, a group perhaps best known for uh, laying eggs and then turning around and nursing their young once they've hatched, um, very unique pr productive strategy. Um, and in this paper, they found that compared to many birds and insects, which have multiple copies of a, a gene that's important for egg laying, um, the platypus and echidna genomes contain only one copy. Um, the more diverged koala has one pseudogene copy and humans have none. Um, so what that might mean is that this unique reproductive strategy might not have been adapted to, but something the rest of us lost as an ability over time. So that's, that's pretty cool to see. 
And if we move further down on the tree of life, we've got these teeny tiny metazoans that have been studied. So for perspective, when I say teeny tiny, I mean very teeny tiny. In this image um, of the two different species of springtails that were studied, that scale bar is only one millimeter. So using the ultra low DNA input workflow for hi-fi sequencing, these researchers were able to generate high quality genome assemblies from individual specimens that small. Something that was definitely previously unattainable with any other sequencing technology. And what they found when they dug into the genomes is that it changed the phylogeny of these species. And while they didn't go so far as to claim uh, that their particular phylogeny was correct, what we can be sure of is that the phylogeny um, does not differ due to artificially creating a genome chimera from pooling individuals. So I'll certainly be keeping tabs on this project to see what they end up concluding. And last, but certainly not least, here's an example of IsoSeq being used in an ant brain. <coughs> so this group previously did a lot of short read sequencing um, and even single cell RNA sequencing. And their previous annotation, HCell50, based on short reads, turned out to be pretty incomplete and was helped along by the full length trans transcript sequencing that they did with PacBio. In this example on the left, um, their previous annotation had two gene models at this locus where each model had one copy uh, of a gene analogous to a single gene in Drosophila that carried two copies. Uh, the new annotation, HCell51, merged these into a single gene model that finally matched the ortholog in Drosophila. So correcting uh, errors in the previous annotation. And in the figure on the right, we see that the new annotation also increased the number of mapped single cell RNA seq reads by an average of 44%, getting way more information out of their other data sets. All in all, a very cool project. So I think it's safe to say that HiFi sequencing is enabling plant and animal research by helping uncover new biology. Whether you're studying complex plants, breeding crops for the future, protecting biodiversity, or trying to understand the phylogeny of teeny tiny specimens. <laughs>